uh, which we will which we will um, continue uh, throughout the process uh, and engagement to get this project up and running. So uh, Rick, you could go to the slides now if you'd like. Um, and we can go to the second slide. Make sure I get the right one. Perfect. Cool. Yeah, so on the call tonight, um, as we listed last time, we have listed the folks here under introductions who will be making part of the presentation tonight. Um, there are others on the phone as well, uh, including uh, Sia Rosenthal from uh, the Secretariat, uh, uh, Health and Human Services. Um, so I'm Assistant Commissioner Doyle, Frank Doyle, please call me Frank. Um, and um, from DPH, my responsibility is the overall move uh, from design of the interior of the building as far as making sure that it is clinically operationally sound, best practices, et cetera, um, according to the needs of the hospital. Um, and I work very closely with this entire team for DCAM who are responsible for the actual project itself until we get the keys in uh, probably second or third quarter of 2024. Uh, but we're working in deep collaboration, everyone on this call, and I really appreciate the whole team. I also appreciate the time that all of you as abutters are spending your you know, volunteer time, if you will, uh, to help us be better at what we do and to help us be better at addressing the concerns that you have. Um, you know, well, let me first kick it over. Gordon, are you on yet? If not, Francis, are you on? So I'll just kick it over. So let me kick it over for Rick Pelvino to introduce his team. Uh, just to mention Gordon Wren, who will be joining us shortly is the director overall of this project for DCAM, as well as members of his team. Um, so Rick uh, is the managing principal of SLAM. Um, they have responsibility as the architects of this entire building, designing the entire building. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll be working closely with the construction company uh, when it comes on board. Um, I will note before I kick it to you, Rick, that uh, Jim Dabrowski um, has joined us now. He is the senior project executive. You can see him at the bottom of this list for Gilbane, the, the construction company, Gilbane Building Company, uh, who will be doing all of the construction. And so we're really pleased to have Jim join this team. You'll become more familiar with him. You will have his name and whomever he assigns to continue participating in this abutters communication process as we move forward. So Rick, your team. Yeah, so again, uh, Rick Palvino with the SLAM Collaborative Architects, uh, managing principal uh, on the project. Also uh, with me is Neil Martin, uh, design Hello. principal as well and Jessica Petru, uh, our landscape architect, uh, all of us of which uh, presented to you folks or were part of the conversation with you folks back in April as well. Thanks very much, Rick. So you'll see the objectives. I won't go through them today. They're pretty familiar with to you, I'm sure. Um, this is really an um, ongoing forum to be able to present to you where we are right in the project, where we are at with responding to your prior comments, um, advice and direction. Um, and to take more of that in tonight. Um, so I'll go through all of those points in, in the next slide. So, you know, you'll see from the agenda and from this list, um, you know, kind of a similar framework for this meeting. So I will verbally go through a number of these issues that you have raised uh, and give verbal comment about them, but we do have a PowerPoint to follow, uh, which I'll address in more detail with, you know, um, PowerPoint slides referring to the actual site itself, much as we did the last time. We'll try and Rick go through those slides completely first and then go back slide by slide like we did last time so everybody can go back to the slide they want to talk about. Because um, we may answer some of the questions if they arose as you were going. I figure we'll get through it first and then go back because we may have already addressed some of the questions that might arise. Um, so for us, um, I'll change my view here a little bit, bear with me. Um, we have been tracking very closely. I think my team, um, uh, Rachel Hunt primarily, but also on the DCAM side, Francis Hughes, who have been tracking all of the 
comments very clearly and, and succinctly for us to make sure we're following up. If we miss them, please tell us we've missed something. So in general terms, um, corrections and van parking was uh, in the impacts were a, a large amount of the last meetings conversation and the concern that was raised. So I'll give you a little bit of a verbal update. You will see much more of the update in the PowerPoint slide. Um, we've had, we reviewed all of the areas that were recommended to us to look into for um, van DOC and HOC van parking so that they did not have to line up all at the end of the alleyway um, and take away more green space there. And we did the best we could with all of that. And a later slide will show you exactly where we're at. I will just mention that um, the city of Boston, um, Boston Transportation Department, their commissioner assigned someone to me and he was extremely helpful in helping what to arrive at what you will see later uh, in a slide. Um, regarding proximity to the neighborhood noise fumes, management of non-authorized parking, et cetera. So to speak to for DOC and the HOCs first, those vans will not be permitted to idle out there for any unnecessary short time, nor for any long-term purposes. Um, that is regulated by both statute and policy within DOC. Um, there will be postings, signage there to remind the drivers of that. And that area will be monitored by both DOC and Department of Public Health cameras. You'll see a layout for those cameras later in the slide deck. Um, and we will be monitoring that from both sides for compliance. Just a, an aside, we expect that at some point in this project, there will be a Shattuck uh, point person for communication with the neighborhood. Um, and that person could of course take in any and all um, complaints, if you will, that, that they are idling. You know, look at your camera or whatever that might be. So you'd have another outlet um, to be able to um, immediately uh, notify of us of any non-compliance in that area if it is of concern to you. Uh, we are not at that point yet to tell you and introduce you to the person that will be doing that, but we certainly have it in our plan. Regarding property maintenance, um, you know, the evergreen trees at the top of the wall, if you will, and the shrub area that is currently there at the end of the alleyway that we talked a lot about last time around. Um, we're pleased that uh, we were able to get contractors out there to clean it up. Um, it was too long delayed. And I apologize again to the abutters for that but I think it looks pretty cleaned up now and they did a pretty nice job cutting back the shrubbery so they were not uh, hiding um, people or other activity going on there. Uh, and that it, there will be a regular schedule for maintenance of that area, as well as the alleyway and the smaller alleyway behind um, the Naval uh, Research Building um, where we have had some drug activity and other homeless activity. Um, so uh, campus police, um, I've talked a lot with our chief of campus police at the Shattuck over in Jamaica Plain. Um, they do have a regular schedule of patrol for the entire site. Their site is much bigger in Jamaica Plain. He will have a scheduled patrol, uh, schedule of patrols, walking patrols on the full site uh, when we uh, begin uh, operations there in 2024. Uh, the actual design of what cops, what, how many officers will patrol at what times and all of that, of course, will be developed as we get closer to the date of move-in. Um, but you can be assured that that will be a regular activity of our campus police. Um, campus police will also uh, be monitoring, as I mentioned, all of the security cameras around the building, which we will see a little bit later. Uh, Department of Corrections will also be monitoring those cameras that their vans travel, the route that they travel. Not all of the cameras in the entire building, there's no need for them to, <clears throat> but uh, certainly all of the areas of concern to DOC and folks that are concerned about the DOC vans. So you'll have double eyes, if you will, on those areas. Um, we talked a little bit last time about un unauthorized parking. Um, we will incorporate uh, responsibility um, for that. Uh, into our campus police um, um, designed um, uh, protocols, if you will. Um, and they will be responsible for um, dealing with un unauthorized parking. I don't have any more on that yet, but it will be part of our planning moving forward as we start to operationalize the design that we are now trying to complete. Um, 
camera monitoring, uh, privacy and security. Uh, as I mentioned before, we will have a slide on that shortly with SLAM, so we'll go through that a little bit more carefully then. DOC other protocols. <clears throat> we were asked about a number of things in the last call. Um, the DOC has a full breadth of protocols, as you could imagine, uh, currently in place, uh, both at Shattuck, but indeed at all of their facilities. Uh, those uh, protocols will be modified uh, as we move closer to move in um, by the Department of Corrections um, and will be specific to the East Newton Pavilion as we get closer to move in. Um, the protocols for DOC and the Houses of Corrections are generally not public, just to let you know that. I hope you can understand that we would not want to publicize what those protocols are so that people could seek the weaknesses in them perhaps in order to try and uh, break through that uh, shield, if you will. So like any other security protocol, whether it's Fenway Park or anywhere else, you do not announce them, you don't post them, you don't show them online um, because you wanna protect the area as best you can. Um, patient escape protocols <laughs> for DOC, folks asked about last time. Again, there's a full set of uh, protocols in any event of an escape. They have been extremely rare. Um, I don't think there have been any in the hospital in the near memory of anyone involved from DPH, but I can't assure you of that. I'm not stating that. I'm just saying that there haven't been any to my knowledge. Um, but there are a full set of uh, breadth of protocols regarding any kind of escape. There's a whole triage with other uh, police entities, the state police, the local Boston police. Um, we will be coordinating also with the BU campus police, uh, the USM um, Medical Center uh, campus police as well. Um, so all of that will be coordinated, is commonly coordinated, is already coordinated out in Jamaica Plain, and a specific plan for all of that will be developed for the East Newton site as well. Um, the delivery, trash pickup schedule, et cetera. Um, I apologize, I don't have a lot of information on that yet. Uh, we are investigating it all, and uh, the folks over at Shattuck and Jamaica Plain are keeping a copy of the trucks as they come in and what size they are and when they're coming in and out because we don't really control that you know you order a delivery and it's not always a specific time so we don't have that kind of record um, readily available we're building it now um, and that's one reason i don't have any much more for you tonight i apologize for that but it will be forthcoming because we are now doing that uh, same thing with trash uh, pickup that will be included in this uh, report that we will give you in probably the next meeting i hope as far as when that is now anyway, along with the delivery schedules, um, so that we can at least project forward when those will probably happen. But of course, all of those will be under a new contract um, when we do move into East Newton. So the specifics again will not be available until closer to move-in day, but we can certainly tell you what we're doing now. And that's what we're investigating to just give you an example of what to be expected over at uh, the East Newton campus. Uh, we were asked about the audible backup signals in the van transports. We'll show you a picture of the van so you can understand what we're talking about. But the uh, backup signals are the same as they are on any of these larger uh, passenger vans. That's really what it is. It's not a shuttle type. It's just a, you'll see it. It's just a van. Uh, and they do have a, a backup um, signal, um, audible backup signal, as well as obviously flashers. Uh, the loading dock, we were asked about the size of the trucks. That is part of what we're investigating uh, and what we'll be reporting on to you later when we have those uh, numbers back as to uh, what the size of those trucks are uh, and when they arrive uh, currently and projected to be in uh, East Newton. Uh, you asked us about rooftop noise and the sources of different types of noise uh, the last time. Uh, that is in the slide deck that SLAM will be presenting momentarily. You asked us about vibrations the last time. Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, investigation going on on that about how to best um, monitor it. I don't think we'll have much to say more about that tonight because we're not concluded on that yet. Uh, but I just wanted to acknowledge that we are tracking it for this conversation. Um, and then finally, the last time we had um, you know, spoken a lot about the start of, not a lot, we spoke some about the start of construction and uh, schedule, uh, that kind of thing. I'm thrilled to have um, uh, the Gilbane, Gilbane um, um, uh, project manager, if you will, I forget, I'm not going back to the slide with your title on it's Jim, so I forgive you so much. 
Um, but he is on the call tonight. He's joining our team as far as uh, regularly joining us on this call. Um, and uh, we'll, now you have a point person that is the uh, uh, head, if you will, the lead for this project on behalf of the construction company, which is Gilbane. And we'll get into that more uh, in the slides ahead, um, but more of the construction side. And we're certainly not asking Gilbane for any presentation tonight. Um, but I wanted you to know that he is on the phone. He's a member of the team. He's going to be participating into the future. So you have that direct connectivity now with the lead person for Gilbain, our construction company, which who will begin construction soon. And with that, Rick, I think, um, well, let me ask first, is there anything first blush that I said that anybody wants to say, whoa, whoa wait a minute, Frank. We just have a comment um, from Marie, who would also like to share some of her status of the green space, but we might want to save that um, for the comments at the end or when we get to that part of the presentation. Hey, Marie, if it's okay with you, could we do it at the conclusion of the presentation of the PowerPoint and when we go back? Is that okay? Thanks for monitoring that for me, Asya. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely make time for that uh, later in the meeting. Thank you, David. Um, so with that, let me kick it to back to Rick, and he can begin the formal PowerPoint presentation, if you will, slide by slide for the area of the site. Great. Th th thank you, Frank. And, and like I, like Frank mentioned, we do have some supporting graphics um, to support what Frank just identified for each of these bullets, or for mo most, if not all of these bullets. Um, but I think you'll you'll uh, this will help you understand uh, what we're what we're talking about. So, so the first bullet, as we talked about, is the correction van parking and the impacts and, and everything Frank reiterated. This is an existing condition. Again, how you read this, this is the existing building uh, at East, East Newton Pavilion. Here are your homes, uh, the condo homes right here in the Naval Blood Bank, uh, the existing loading dock. And the area uh, that was in question and a lot of part of our conversation uh, last month, or last time we chatted was, was the van parking that was slotted to go here at that time. Uh, so this is the existing condition and this is the extent, kind of a graphic representation of, of what you're seeing there. So, so there are several options that were discussed. Um, uh, a lot were thrown out, uh, great ideas uh, by this group. And uh, we took those options to heart. Uh, so, so a couple of those was the, uh, the Naval Blood Bank, if I can find it, the Naval Blood Bank parking. Uh, there was a discussion, uh, why don't we park there? We did look into that investigation. Um, you can kind of see in the background, and if you've been in this area and look, there are, is some equipment here, building focused equipment supporting this building. Um, and, and a lot of the cars that are currently parked there are standard size vehicles. So getting a couple of these oversized vehicles in this area became really difficult. Uh, uh, the clearances required for these vehicles and um, um, just the movement of these vehicles, it became a danger point uh, for an ingress and egress as well. So we, we, we then, uh, there was discussion of the parking structure over here onto the left. Uh, why, why don't uh, the vans just park in the existing structure? If you've uh, been in that structure, uh, parking structures are usually designed with really low uh, floor to floor heights, if you will. Um, um, you can almost hit your head on the structure as you're walking uh, through one of these structures. So uh, we, we did investigate this and uh, the vans just simply can't maneuver within a parking structure such as this. And just, um, just in, on top of that, um, uh, just even walking by or riding by, you would see how low the entrance is. That's probably the lowest point of the whole garage when you're inside the DLB garage. Uh, the vans could not even get into it because of that low height. Sorry. Yep, no, it's perfect. And then we also talked about, what, what about this lot? Um, uh, number one, uh, this project doesn't own that lot. However, um, there could have been accommodations possibly. However, it was confirmed and, and uh, Frank can confirm this, that, that it will continue to be used for valet parking to support the doctor's offices and the Preston Family Building, I believe. So this is still designated as valet parking only. 
That's correct. That, that the ownership of that has been retained by Boston Medical Center. We do not own it. Um, we did uh, discuss it with them and they informed us that they are going to continue using it for the valet parking and would not be able to assign it to us for van use. And another item was, was discussion, what about parking on the street? So, so we did start doing that investigation on the street, uh, particularly East Newton Street. And with that, um, what we have been able to determine, um, and Frank was uh, great in working with the Department of Transportation and getting the ability to park five of the programmed vans on the street at East Newton Pavilion. So five of those, these vans, so uh, the, Frank mentioned that uh, uh, we, we have a picture of the van and this is the typical uh, Department of Corrections van. Uh, it's typically unmarked. Um, it's basically a stretch passenger vehicle is what it is. It's roughly, um, it is a little oversized. I have the dimensions um, about 23 feet by nine feet versus a standard vehicle of say 16 by seven vehicles that you and I drive, smaller SUVs and, and sedans and coupes. Um, um, so it is a little oversized. You can see how it's uh, overhanging out, out of this uh, standard parking space, but it's not excessive. So what, we're, what we looked at is putting five of these vehicles on East Newton Pavilion and refreshing um, by still maintaining some green space, but to meet the program of the facility and on-site parking, we still need to require a few vans back here. But what we were able to do, we only need to accommodate about a third of that existing. You can see in this very light dashed line, the existing green space that's there, but we are able to maintain two, approximately two thirds of that existing green space. So I think it was a, it's a great compromise um, on getting, on maintaining a few of the vans on site and a few of the vans, I'll call it off site uh, on the Boston street parking. And, and just to clarify on that, Rick, um, you know, I investigated with the Department of Corrections and the um, um, county houses of corrections, um, you know, how immediate is on site? What does that mean? Because I know some people mentioned last time, well, there are garages or parking lots around the neighborhood, and they all affirmed the county corrections officer um, representatives, as well as the DOC, that they had to have them immediately adjacent to. They could not go off-site other than adjacency, um, which is why we went to East Newton Street. We're not representing any other garages or parking lots. We just can't use them. So that is our current um, direction uh, and current uh, process and solution at this point. I didn't know if we wanted to um, stop for questions per topic or go through the whole presentation. Well, why don't we get through the whole presentation and then go back to each slide and answer any questions that anybody wants to raise or address. Thanks. Perfect. And we don't have an exhaustive slideshow here to, to put folks to sleep, but um, it is support documentation from uh, uh, Frank's kickoff and uh, we'll, we'll get through this pretty quickly. Well, so I think it would be, you don't think it would be easy to address each issue as it comes up? I'm just fearful that we won't get through all of it and we may be answering some of the questions in a later slide already. If you, whichever way you want to do it. I, I, I think we sh let's, let's keep going through the presentation if we could just for five or 10 more minutes because I agree with Frank. If we, if we sort of, the, par the parking issue clearly will be, well, I shouldn't assume, based on last time, it'll probably be the, our biggest area of talking around. And if we start on that conversation right now, I'm fearful that we won't adequately address the other things that people raised last time. So let's just keep it brief, but let's let's at least give it five or 10 more minutes if, if we could, it'd be my suggestion. Thank you, David. Yeah, and that's all we need to get through these slides is five to okay. 10. Um, so uh, property maintenance and, and um, some security. And, and uh, so, so property maintenance, as Frank mentioned, uh, the cleanup of the raised uh, planter bed and also the green space out here. Uh, we did notice a, a breach, if you will. Uh, we understand uh, some folks uh, are able to climb up on the, onto this retaining wall, and we found that breach at the west side of this retaining wall. So this, this is an image in this area right here, this red line. 
uh, represents this this wall line right here. So uh, people like you and I can simply just walk up these stairs. It's a landing into the building, but it's only about five five or six feet, and folks can uh, breach this wall and get access to this. So moving forward, uh, we recognize that, and we're going to be providing a nine climbable fence and uh, a barrier of some sort so folks can't access this. Uh, I should say the public can't access this uh, raised planter bed. We will have to make accommodations for maintenance personnel to get up here to, to maintain this area every now and then. Uh, but just to reassure and to inform folks that we will be, uh, we've recognized this and we will be designing a, uh, a secure solution for that. And, and we will review that secure solution with the abutters at a future meeting when we come to that point. Thanks. So this is just a, a quick picture of the happy crew cleaning up uh, that area. Uh, again, the raised planter and the, and the uh, on grade uh, planters as well. So um, uh, it was great to get that crew out there. You can see everything from chainsaws to rakes and they really did a good job. Is is right. Uh, Frank talk, talked about enhanced security. Um, so we've been working with our security consultant and, and us and, and best practice. So these black dots represent uh, proposed camera locations. And um, the, the blue shaded area, for this area at least, is all the coverage that's being had by all these cameras. So um, some are pole mounted, uh, say this one, and this will be on a pole, this will be on a pole. These will be on that retain that high retaining wall. Pretty much typically the cameras and the technology of the cameras have advanced tremendously over the years as far as 4K technology, uh, 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 fisheye versus flood, flood views. Um, so we're at zooming uh, and for instance, you know, getting down this, this avenue here and access to Brookline because we know all sorts of mischief occur here. So that, that will be covered by a camera shooting down this alley in this direction. And, and all, all, everything in blue is being sur surveillanced, if you will by campus police or in some cases, DOC. And we know that um, uh, we've heard that, you know, um, security is an important detail for all of the abutters. We also recognize that privacy is as well. So in addition to making sure that we have eyes on all of the blue area, we are also making sure we don't have eyes other than on the blue area in the design of these cameras, just to assure you that. I know Rick often says that to me. Yep, so, so each camera has a throw or a cone of vision. The further you get from that cone of vision, the less resolution, if you will, that, that is gained. So, so um, when, when we design these cameras, we're gonna be providing horse blinders, if you will, that only cover this alleyway. In other words, we, would, we wouldn't be creeping into uh, your property or anybody else's property uh, for that matter as well. So noise vibration. So, so we talked a lot about noise vibration. This is showing uh, the van location, the five spots instead of the 10 that was that were shown there last two months ago, last month and a half ago. Um, also uh, as part of noise is the loading dock. As Frank mentioned, we're working with um, the existing Shattuck personnel and understand through facilities on, on delivery timeframes and size of vehicles. So we'll follow up, uh, uh, as Frank mentioned earlier, uh, in another follow-up meeting on that. Um, we're gonna talk about rooftop noise in a second uh, with another slide. And um, a, a new entity came, came into the mix as part of our design process as a, a new fire pump uh, house, if you will. So it's a small structure that's going to be located here. It is noiseless, if you will. Um, the, there are pumps in the, um, within the facility, but the actual uh, circulation of, of fire water, if you will, is in the fire pump in this enclosure. And I'm, I'm going to show you an image of what that is. Um, there's no sound coming from it. However, there is some testing that does occur on a monthly and uh, uh, annual basis by the facilities and the fire department. Um, there's also a fire department connection here. And this still, again, we need per, per code, building code and safety, we still need to maintain access for, for fire vehicles. 
and uh, public safety vehicles uh, back here as well. Yeah, just to add one small thing that may arise in people's minds. So the fire pump apparatus is currently located in the basement of yep. the East Newton Pavilion. So every building has this. However, obviously East Newton was built a long time ago. And for resiliency and code compliance purposes, it is no longer adequate to be in the building. We can't place it in the building. That just has arisen as a, something that we've acknowledged and this has been added to the design. I know it may be a disappointment to some, but I wanted to give you the full background. Yep, and we, and we have a rendering of what that looks like uh, as well um, to share that. Yep. Um, we spoke briefly last time about, about the equipment yard over here. If you remember, there's an oxygen tank, uh, 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 an above ground a fuel tank and switch gear. Other than a, a few clicks and clacks from the switch gear um, that's mostly internal, it's no ambient noise contributing to the environment from this, from this equipment yard right here. Excellent. So, so continuing on the noise dialogue. So if you remember, um, this may be a little difficult to read. We try to make this as clear as possible. So, so this is a building elevation. So, so this is looking from the west, wait, from, from, from the east looking west. So you can see your townhomes here. You can see the loading dock in, in section, if you will. There, here's the elevation of the building. So that's simply just looking at, a, at the side of the building. And here is the equipment yard. What we're not showing for clarity is the existing um, um, dental building here. So as far as noise sources, um, just to give you some perspective and some dimensions as, as we're looking. So the property line that we're talking about is right here. Um, that 15 foot alley uh, fire, fire access and, and your, your backyard access, if you will, is right here coming from Albany. And the distance between the townhomes and the main building is uh, 72 feet. And the height of the building to the top of uh, what we call the parapet from the grade is about 198 feet. And the distance from the property line, uh, the, the width of the alley, if you will, is 15 feet is where the fire pump and the raised planter work. So the fire pump uh, sits right here, the fire pump enclosure, and the, that raised planter is behind it. Um, again, the, um, there is going to be some, some ambient noise from deliveries from the loading dock. Again, you know, you know your areas better than anybody else. Um, that, that loading dock uh, recesses down a grade. So it's quite a steep grade uh, getting down to that lower basement level equipment yard. Um, what has been added to the project since, um, since BMC owned it was uh, two new exhaust fans. These fans are only going to be operational during an extreme surge event within the hospital. In other words, every bed is taken and we just need more air circulating within the, um, within the building. There, there has been a request for more isolation beds, um, similar to ICU or isolation where you have to isolate a patient uh, um, and they require their own uh, additional air change movements. Um, so these existing fan or new fans accommodate that. The, there will be, be no uh, low noise fans, the best we can make it, but they're high output as far as the, the fan itself, the pressure, the velocity of the air uh, uh, that it's pushing out. So you can kind of see the cone um, that, that uh, the fans will be pushing in that direction. We only have about four minutes, Rick, to finish up the slides and comply yep. with David's request. And, and here's a view um, looking down the alley. Here, here's um, a, a rough rendering of your, of, your, uh, of your homes here. Here's the raised planter. And here is the fire pump enclosure. Now, as far as aesthetics, we're still working on the aesthetics, but we just did want to um, show you generally the mass of what this fire pump enclosure is. Um, there are a couple doors and louvers to this uh, because it needs air to breathe. Uh, this is electrical pump. Um, again, it's not diesel like the old uh, versions. It's electrical, so you'll hear uh, you won't hear anything once this is enclosed. 
Um, it did have to raise again above the flood uh, flood plain line, the 50 year flood plain line, because uh, we're projecting this this facility to be a 50 year plus building. Um, so it's on a raised a plinth, if you will, four feet and an additional 10 feet uh, for the structure. Again, we're working on the aesthetics, so don't get too caught up on that. This is just a graphic representation of, of the mass of it and the general location. Um, again, it's not going to be climbable. Um, uh, you, you see a ledge here, we're, we're gonna make that non-climbable um, and, um, and, and you can't access the, the, the rooftop of this from um, the terrace over here on the, um, on the property side as well. So just in the interest of time. And with the timeline, um, I, I can speak to this for Jim, if you want to do. Jump I can speak, Rick, thanks. Uh, Jim Dabrowski with uh, Kilmaine. Uh, we're all, we are very excited, as Frank was saying, to be part of the team and to be working on this facility and the adjacent uh, properties to uh, bring this beautiful up, updating of the uh, facility. Um, if you remember this slide, last time we showed it, it showed that the alley improvements would be happening in this fall of 2021. And what the team has been working on is to move this into the spring of 2022 so that it parallels with the work of the exterior envelope of the building to, to work to minimize the impact to the overall alley. So we're working those two areas, the utilities and the exterior facade and in parallel so that we uh, work and minimize the impact there. And right now we're working with SLAM in the state to work out the details on this. And when we meet next time, we'll have further information on uh, how we're going to go through this uh, work. One of the things is that we will be mobilizing into the facility in August as it shows here, but that will be uh, getting our offices in the building and starting some of the interior demolition and some of the site improvements more on the plaza side on the opposite side of the building. So. Thank you, Jim. I think that's the last slide, is it? Uh, yes. it, it is, and then we just have the credits, if you will, uh, just contact information and who, who's presenting as well. And all of this will be posted and you'll have access to these uh, through David. He's gonna help us with that. We will also be posting it on our sites, uh, which are noted down below there, mass.gov sites. And um, you, know, you can always call me, call Rachel, uh, email, text us, whatever, and we'll always respond. Um, so to best, um, I think maybe David, if you could help us, um, rather than just going back through the slides in the order that they were just presented, maybe we could go back to the slides in the order that the abutters would like us to go back to. Mm -hmm. So if you could call on a butter to begin that conversation, Rick will flip to that slide and then we'll discuss the issue that gets raised. Let's, let's start then with the, the question of the van parking and sort of people's reactions to that and, uh. Anybody who wants can can just chime in. Great. Well, I'm. Uh, uh, this is Cinda Stoner. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yes. Thank and, you. Hi, Cinda. Hi. Um, I'm just a little bit uh, dismayed that you're going to put any vans behind close by our properties, and I do not understand from your design uh, on this area. I don't know if you can. You probably can't see my pointer next to the green space. You said you have five spots designated. I'm looking at the position of those five spots and they seem to go beyond the wall of the loading dock, the side wall of the loading dock. And I, from experience, know that when BMC owned that property, they used all that area that you are, not the not the part that shows the uh, green space that you propose to use as parking. They use all that area beyond that going toward Albany Street. The the truckers who came in, the delivery people, in order to be able to swing around and get in to that loading dock. So I don't know how that is ever going to be maneuvered and how you can propose parking there when when it's not going to be. Uh, when it, it doesn't seem to be possibly to, to be even used 
as parking. So uh, I'm just uh, uh, just want to continue a little bit with this. Um, the the I think it's still outrageous that you are proposing any parking, any of those vans behind our property, which means you, I think Frank had said there would be 15. You say you're going to only you need to put a third back there. Well, that's five vans back back behind our, our close to our houses in the back. And I don't think I think that's it's just it's just not acceptable. And I just get this feeling that we're just not being heard about how we do not want any of that green space be taken for parking. And um, you, Frank, you had stated in the past that um, you would be having these, uh, these van trips uh, between the hours of 7 to 4.30 in the afternoons, but that's not necessarily the case. Because if there are emergency services that could require, there are going to be, I know, emergency services that are going to be required at any time for some of the DOC clients throughout a 24 hour period, and it can be any day of the week. Um, we're gonna constantly be interrupted by the beeps of the vans backing up and the noise and the fumes from the vans as the vans idle in cold and hot weather. And we know, and I know some of this is so redundant, I still feel like I'm just keep repeating myself that you said in the last meeting uh, you know, there will be idling signs and we know they're not effective and you're not, and you said, well, I call the state police and that's a, that's a waste of their resources. And you also stated that the campus police have no power. And so what, what, what's going to happen is as far as I can determine is you're, you're going to create a situation where there's going to be, if there are vans parked beyond it and those beeps that you talk about, I know deliveries that are made across the street diagonally across from me on East Brookline Street, when those beeps go off, it is maddening. I can hear it from the front of my house to the back of my house. And so that when you talked about, uh, you know, putting this upon us, as far as I'm concerned, there's gonna be a, a situation where there's gonna be hostility that's gonna be developed between those van drivers and our neighbors. And it's gonna leave the impression that the neighborhood is the problem in this part of the operation of the Shattuck. And that's just not fair to put this upon us. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, you're creating a public nuisance for our residents and our streets. And our street, if you put any of those large vans in the back or near the back of our properties. And especially with that, the turning on, the turning off and those, the beeping sound, it is just, it is just not fair to this community. Uh, I, so I guess I have three questions. You know, if you were living down here, Frank, would you, if you lived in my, if you were, had my premises that I live in, would you be, find this parking area acceptable? Because it is, it is outrageous. And it is outrageous to think that you can just put this kind of a noise uh, maker machinery in and out, possibly 24 hours a day unexpectedly. And you once stated that you, you know, would you find it acceptable? So if I could, Cinder, because you raised a lot of issues. No, so I'm at, no, I'll, no. I'm I'll directly, asking you, I'll I'm directly asking, answer what I'm you're asking. I'm asking you this question, okay? I'm I'll asking directly, you this question. You let me, Would you, you let me find answer. this acceptable? Yes if or you, no? Yes. Affirmatively, yes. I'm a Dorchester boy. Okay. I'm very involved in healthcare, and we cannot get our patients here, some of the most vulnerable patients in the state, into this hospital without accommodating these vans. And we're doing our very best to mitigate the impact on the alleyway. And you uh, once, just, okay, and you once stated that you would be transparent. That's so right. So what we need to know is who are the members of your team? Because I want to I want to know the members. Other people would like to know who the members are. We know to I would like to, and I know other people would like to know who are the decision makers concerning this proposed parking area. We need to know, Frank. So the team is listed on the um, on this side deck that I showed earlier. And the decision makers on this are ultimately the Commissioner of the Department of Public Health and the Secretary of Health and Human Services for the Commonwealth. 
Cinda, I promise we'll come back to you if you'd like, but let me let me just open it up for a few other neighbors to uh, sure. to react or speak on, on, on this particular issue. Thanks. Just if I could knock out, just address a couple of other little ones. So when Cinda was speaking about my um, comments before about the vans coming in and out of the hospital between 7 a.m. and 4 uh, 30 p.m. And she said, well, there's emergency cases at night and overnight and on weekends. Those people come by ambulance, not by van. And they enter on the plaza level in the emergency bay. They do not go through the sally port. They do not go down the alley and they do not park in the van's locations just to answer that one. Okay, Thank Marie, you. I see you have your hand raised. So if you want, I promise you we'll, we'll, we'll address your concern around the landscaping, but if you wanna speak on the, uh, the parking, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. You can hear me? Yes. Okay. So in the in this one block area of Albany Street between East Brookline Street and East Newton, there are four delivery, receiving and delivery loading slips slash slash um, slips or whatever the, the shack is. So within like a, a block, you have these huge vans. Now it's quiet, perhaps because it's pandemic and September is gonna be back to normal. So now we have the shattuck, perhaps not fully using that, that loading zone, um, loading dock, but you have the um, Evans Bio Research Building. You have the Solomon Carter Fuller Mental Health Building. You have the Dental Building. They all have slips that require these trucks to use Albany Street as part of their delivery system. So you're you are blocking up Albany Street. So so they have to pull up and then they have to back up. I've seen this and we've seen it all. And now we have four of them and so with with now with you're putting those um ambulances there you're taking up those parking spots you're now you are requiring these big tractor trailers coming in going up albany street and backing out rather than using the shattuck property to pull in and pull around and back up so I find this completely, the design of these receiving and delivery slips are kind of crazy to me. And, and please explain to me how you think this is not gonna be disruptive to the neighborhood. So shall I answer that one, Dave? Oh, do you wanna to go to one? Yeah, no, why don't you, why don't you yeah. So, um, I understand your concern. Um, it is a reality of having a hospital there that there are deliveries, as I said, and I apologized early on. I don't have the schedule for you. I can assure you that the schedule uh, of deliveries into the ramp and loading dock area are significantly less than what was being done there when it was being operated as a full hospital by BMC. However, I don't have that to prove, so don't accept that until I do. Secondly, I would call on Rick because I know that Rick and his team are doing radius studies mm -hmm. of that area so that we know that we can accommodate uh, uh, trailer vans, trailer trucks rather, to be able to back up into that area even if we use those five spaces. And again, it's five as opposed to the original 15 um, uh, on the site. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, so let me, let me, can I just ask one thing just to clarify, Frank? So. Um, because Cinda had raised the concern that if the vans park in this hypothetical new area that is most near to Albany Street, that they would be impinging on an area that in point of fact, tractor trailers need to cross in order to be able to maneuver into the loading dock. Are you yes. saying that you're studying that issue now? Or are you saying no, that you're no. certain that's not? We've, that that we've, already, not we've already done a, a radius study for those vans. And that's what I, I mean, those trucks. And that's what I was asking Rick to, to talk about. So yeah, we'll talk it, to the direct uh, current state of the radius. Yeah, and, and I believe, Jessica, I, um, you, you conducted some turning radius uh, studies, I believe. 
Bears on mute. Yes, we have been looking at um, the turning radiuses needed for the different trucks. Um, we have specific programs that we work in that um, with uh, the, the wheel base and width, you know, of a tractor trailer to run these studies of all different lengths. Um, so we have been looking into uh, the turning uh, needs within this area, not utilizing the angled band uh, areas and how it uh, can be received into the loading dock. So yes. Yeah, and, it, and it's your belief, it's your conclusion that they are in fact capable of being accessed without crossing that, that, that hypothetical parking area. Is that correct? You, you broke up a little bit, but I feel like what you had said was from our studies that we looked at, we we were not utilizing the angled parking area and the truck or the okay. tractor trailers, box trucks, those kind of things can, can um, adequately back into the loading dock area. So those were the studies that we did um, review um, and okay. conclude it works based okay. on the size trucks that we were looking at. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Angela, you have your hand raised, so go ahead. Hi, yeah, I, I'm still, I'm still, I'm, I'm on the, so we get, we went from, what was it, 15 or 20 spots to these five. We, we don't want any. And, and the problem here is that you say that, oh, there, there's, it's mandated, there's no idling and there's no, that it happens all the time. I hear trucks idling. I live right on the edge, on the back end and the edge of that green space. And I hear trucks all the time. And so the, the idea that you're going to have people patrolling and telling your drivers, don't idle in the summer when it's hot or in the winter when it's cold and that they're gonna go somewhere else, they're not. They're gonna sit there and idle. And that is impinging on the air quality because I will absolutely have the fumes come right into my window. That's the way it's happened before. I'm not, I'm, you know, I, I just, I don't, I just don't agree with, oh, well, we just reduced it a little bit. And uh, so, yeah, you, you still have five vans back there. So if I may, um, so again, these are standard passenger vans. They are not trucks. They're just like we have for elderly shuttles, the larger elderly shuttles in schools, uh, transportation. So just to just keep everybody focused on what they are and not what they're not. I don't know where the fumes came from in the past that you're referring to. Um, certainly wasn't, a, I, well, I don't know if it was from cars or not back in the alley. Um, more likely it was probably the trucks. Um, you know, we have reduced this significantly, uh, as I mentioned before, and we will continue to investigate every possible alternative. This is not an end. This was what we were able to accomplish over the past several weeks since the last meeting. Um, but this is where the state of the design is now. And that's where we're gonna have regular meetings with the butters to review what we can accomplish and what we can't. But just, I just wanna go back to what I said before. We have to have these patients come in by transport. The transport's vans have to stay quickly adjacent to the site. They can be on East Newton Street, but not other uh, areas um, distant from the site. Um, so we're trying our best. And I just wanna remind folks that I did tell you before that the vans, when we were talking about 14 vans earlier on, that was from a peak study done at the Jamaica Plain campus mm -hmm. of a two year period um, from three or four years ago. The, but I'm, I'm trying to just go with what I know to date and not project out some kind of mitigation that is not real yet. But I just will say that I know already post COVID that we have dramatically reduced the number of, not dramatically, we have reduced the number of patient visits from the DOC and HOCs because, and I think I mentioned it the last time around, because we started using a lot more telehealth. And therefore, it saves the DOC and HOC van costs and, and transport costs and corrections officer costs and everything else. So they are starting to use that more often and a little bit less um, direct visits. But again, that was peak hour 
one hour during the day at its peak on average over that period of time was 14 vans. So even if all of that was still true and there was no reduction because of telehealth and all of that, it is a one hour peak during the day that was experienced during that three year period study. But um, if I may speak, I did not refer to the, them as trucks. I said vans, I, see, I can see exactly what they are. Um, I'm just saying that when this study, when this all was planned, there was no input from any of us to, so that you, you wouldn't have come, in, you wouldn't have gotten to where we are right now if there were planning. And when, you, when, in, when this was being planned, it would have been nice to talk to us and not have us sort of, we plan this, this is what we're gonna do. Um, and I, I still hear, it still sounds to me like, well, you know, this is what we're gonna do. We're, 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 we're listening, but we're not listening. We're, we're, we hear you, but we're not listening. And that this is what we're gonna do. And that it seems kind of final to me. Well, just again, this is the planning that we're doing now with you. It has accomplished getting back the green space from what was initially presented by the design team as parking along that area to accommodate the House of Corrections and DOC. So I would hope that most of you think we really are trying to address what we're hearing to the best of our ability and we will continue to do so. And we're now moving in for another three years. So we will continue to meet with the butters regularly. I've already promised you that. We'll continue to review the current state of the design. We'll review every time you raise comments uh, and concerns, how we have addressed them or at least investigated them and what the result of that is as we have those answers. So I would hope most people feel that we're trying to be as transparent and as responsive as we can be. Um, I'm sorry that you feel the way that you feel. Frank, I so, want to ask you just one quick question. You've got the five, the, the five van parking spaces over here next to the loading dock. You've got the five on street parking spaces, right? And so yeah. where did you say these additional five vans would be? So the, the, it was, would have been four under that study that showed 14 at peak. So there is flow in and out of the Sally port and we are still continuing to investigate this as far as are these 10 sufficient, five on the campus, five adjacent to the campus on East Newton because the Sally port as you see on the far left where it says correction Sally port actually holds four vans at a time. So during that peak hour, if we continue to have 14, there would be space, but we have to further investigate that center to answer your question more effectively. Okay. Uh, so Helene and David have had their hands raised patiently. So I'm gonna to get to you next. I'm just gonna ask one thing though. If people can, can find themselves to two minutes, at least for their initial comments and questions. And if you have more than that, we, I promise you will come back, but just in the interest of fairness and getting to everybody and covering all the issues that would be appreciated. And also sticking to the topic of parking just for the moment before we move on. So Helene, go ahead. I was wondering, why do they need those large fans? How many people, do they take one person at a time or two? Or why can't they use smaller cars? And, number, and also, why can't they park on Albany Street, this, there was a bicycle rack there or something. Why can't they take, move that bicycle rack down and why can't they park on Albany Street? What are they talking about that they need to um, be easily ex accessible or something? Albany Street would, wouldn't take much to, to um, get back to the facility. Al Albany Street isn't very far. Why can't they park there? So I'll be very honest. Um, I did not investigate with the Department of Transportation for the city. Any alternative on Albany Street, I'll take that back as well. There's potentially a, 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 another alternative. Um, as far as the size of the vans, they have a van fleet all over the Commonwealth, the, House, the uh, Department of Corrections and the Houses of Correction. They use these as their standard vans everywhere. So they don't have a van fleet uh, or vans just for us. And the vans, quite frankly, go to all of their facilities. So it's not just one facility could buy one van and then send their patients to us. 
these vans pick up. I think I heard earlier on, but don't hold me to it, please, that there were three or four on average, but there are also two corrections officers. There has to be space between the, uh, between the prisoners while they're in the van. And that's why they use this size van in general uh, as their typical um, uh, van size. Right, but the, the state is flush with cash. They can buy new vans for this, this particular facility. They don't have to use these huge vans, which I don't know, since we would create more of a problem. They can um, buy new vans just for the facility, just a regular car. I don't know. Oh, that's it. Thanks. Thanks for looking into this parking on Albany Street. I will. David? Thanks, thanks, David. Um, I, I did want to say first off, um, you know, thank you to Frank and um, to Jessica and Rick for um, at least taking our our issues into consideration and and brainstorming. You guys could have totally written this completely off, um, and um, it does give me hope that there that we will find uh, even more common ground uh, going forward with that, um, given given the fact that you're working with us. So I did want to say thank you. I know um, uh, you guys are, are not are, are not blowing our, our requests off, which I do appreciate. Um, with regards to the parking, um, you know, I do appreciate that some of the green space is being preserved. Um, and my my question is, it's it still seems and I recall from the first presentation, there was a lot of focus in on the improvements being done to the front of the building, to the green space being added there. I look at this picture and I see at least 10 cars, obviously probably smaller than the vans that are being described here, parked in front of uh, the Shattuck building at this at the sort of uh, half circle um, entryway. And what I wonder is, is that, is can there be some consideration of using this space along with the five on street parking spaces to find areas for these vans to um, to idle or to rest while they're waiting for the uh, patients. Um, I do totally get that you guys are trying to make a lovely entryway for this facility and to improve it and make it less um, uh, urban. Um, but at the same token, I feel like you're missing the point that we're trying to make. You're taking and adding green space into an industrial urban area where the residents of this neighborhood are not going to be really taking advantage of that and residing and you're removing it from what is the sort of very minimal buffer between this industrial area uh this urban area and and our residents um and and so if there's a way to reimagine and rethink that front space and i'm sure there's ways to incorporate greenery there without um making it completely concrete as it is today um, and providing an option for, for parking. I think that's something that should be explored. And I would tell you everyone in the neighborhood and on this call um, will appreciate this. And the people who are utilizing this facility, it, they, their, their appreciation of your facility is what's going on inside the building. It's not what's going on outside the building. And I think if we keep that as the focus um, and you put your efforts towards giving all the great resources that you're going to be putting on for these uh, for these clients inside this building um, while preserving what we need in the back in terms of that buffer, I think that will serve the purpose of uh, helping the patients that you guys want to achieve um, and, and keeping the neighbors um, appeased and keeping that green space that we clearly value uh, as one of the sole buffers between the noise that comes from that loading dock and the noise that would be coming from those uh, additional parking spaces. Um, and then just finally, and I'll stop talking, um, you know, obviously the loading dock is for, for large trucks dropping off material for picking up trash and things. I, I wonder too, there's, um, there's spaces there uh, that I see between the equipment yard and the other edge of the loading dock, if that has been explored at all as another area for um, the, the vehicles to possibly park it does two things. It moves those vehicles further away from the from the, the homes on East Brookline Street, uh, preserves that green space and that buffer that could reduce any noise that's coming. Um, uh, obviously, it's not going to make it completely quiet, but it is also an alternative option. Uh, I know it's not much of an area. 
Um, and with this equipment yard, it's probably going to be encroaching on that. But I just wonder if that's an option as well. Let me um, um, respond. Um, David, thanks, first of all, for your comment. Um, we really are trying uh, really hard. Um, the um, plaza, to address what you raised, the plaza area uh, on the left side of the plaza area as we're looking at it, where you see the three cars, that's a, draw, that's a, a pick up and drop off area. So that's not permanent spaces. It's for people that need to bring cars in and out to drop off patients, drop off visitors, whatever, uh, since there is no other parking there. And then the ones you see on the right-hand side are mostly accommodating state vehicles like the campus police cruisers, like the DOC present cruiser that they have. They have two units. Uh, so those are really restricted just to those uses. They are not offered for parking. And, quite, and because the transports have to go through the Sally Port for security purposes, when you look at the other end over there where the correction Sally Port is shown and the stacking of those vans, they go into a really tight security zone for unloading and, and, uh, and to put patients back in when they're finished with their appointments. So there wouldn't be a possibility of you know, parking there and taking them over there um, and there's no real space there for any long-term parking while they would be in, in other words, in exchange for parking on the street or parking in the back where we already have those five located at the moment. So thank you for that suggestion. We did look at it pretty carefully to see if there was any way we could offload in there. And with the other needs of the hospital, we just can't, and the DOC and HOC, we just can't, except to mention again that the ambulance bay will accommodate ambulances no matter where they come from, including DOC and HOC over, overnights. And that's where you see it backing into the ambulance bay at the midsection of the arc of the driveway. Um, and the radiuses, the parking radiuses are really tight on that. Jessica would mm -hmm. confirm, but I, I don't mm -hmm. want to get into her studies on it, but it's very tight to park anything there and still have egress and access uh, uh, to that plaza area. So that one we looked at really carefully and we have not been able to accommodate any of the vans there. As far as the loading dock area, you're right, there is that space. And at one point we're thinking of trying to accommodate and move one of the vans over to there. To date, that has not been successful for a whole bunch of reasons I won't go into right now, but we will continue to investigate that and report back to you again at the next meeting, I promise, as far as the results of a revisit of whether or not they can move, be moved from the five spaces we're now showing to a space on the other side of the ramp. It had a lot to do, the, the reason why we were discouraged from doing it was it did have a lot to do with the trucks moving in and out uh, of the ramp area, as I remember it. I'm not quite sure that's true, but uh, we'll, we'll push that to next time so we don't miss other questions, if that's okay, David. Thanks. So Frank, just to understand that, and then Josh, I'm calling you next. Um, you're saying that there is at least hypothetically a, a possibility of moving some of the vans to the opposite side of the loading dock, closer to the equipment yard, is that? There was only one space that one, we were able one space, to put okay. in there when we first looked at it. But because of the radius study, et cetera, we were advised that that was not a solution that was going okay. to be usable. So that's why we had not showing it. Doesn't mean that all of these things aren't still being debated and discussed among the design team to try and come to the right resolution that can hopefully accommodate the neighbors as best as possible. It really okay. is our goal. Okay, Josh. Hi there. Um, so this going back to the the green space in the front of the building and the and parking and all that. Did you actually look at moving the green space in the front of the building to where the additional parking spaces are in the back of the building and then using the front as parking rather than green space? So we did not um, for several reasons. One is the, um, that the substructure underneath that plaza um, is only able to bear a certain amount of weight. So there's only so many cars you can put on there anyway, number one. Number two, our commissioner directed me and the secretariat concurred at the same time that we wanted to make this area as pleasant as we could. And I mean, we could have pulled out all the greenery, um, but we still wouldn't have been able to put in any substantial parking there. It would have been another one or two. It would not be vans again because the vans have to go through the Sally port. So, you know, I just, I keep coming back to that, but 
anyway, um, so yes, we did look at it. Uh, it's also a sloped area, uh, but it could not accommodate the weight of additional vehicles on there, um, just to give you a direct answer. Does anyone have any other questions or comments about the parking? And again, if people could be brief. All right. no. Can I just follow up real quickly, David, sure. just about that, the, the accommodating of the weight and, um, you know, clearly those cars in the front uh, that you said, uh, Frank, are for the DOC um, officers and administrative folks. I wonder, you know, those clearly look like, um, uh, pedestrian, like, you know, regular cars, not these large vans. Um, I wonder if maybe thinking about using the parking structure for those individuals may be an alternative and that would free up space there. Um, and then also contra contracting down that green space, obviously trying not to get rid of it. You want a sort of nice entryway, you know, you want a little curb appeal for your facility. Um, but, um, that might be an, an option to eliminate the weight of all those parked cars and allow for five more vehicles to park up front um, uh, and, and give, uh, give a, another option. Just trying to throw out ideas to, again, hold on to what we can back in the, in the alleyway there. I appreciate that very much. Sure. And thanks for offering more insight and suggestions. And we will take that back within the team, um, revisit what we visited earlier, but with a new objective of trying to respond um, and reevaluate. Thanks. So Frank, can we, bef just before we move on to the next topic, can we um, ask you to do two things? One, to summarize, if not now, then in an email after this meeting, you know, the next day or two or three, what are the other live options for, for van parking other than this configuration that you're currently showing? And, and recognizing that some may or may not turn out to actually be options, at least from your standpoint, but what, what's still on the table? Um, and in that context, I'd just like to ask two things be looked at specifically. One is Helene had uh, observed accurately that there is a lot of parking potentially available on Albany Street. Now, whether the area in front of the needle is actually available or whether perhaps there are security concerns for that facility because of its nature that would preclude parking there, I don't know. But certainly the, qu the question is what, if anything, is available on Albany Street? And then my question would be, that it's, you know, it's terrific that you've secured five spots on East Newton Street, but East Newton Street has quite a bit more parking than just that. And obviously there are other competing demands there too, but whether it might be possible to secure additional spaces on East Newton Street. I can certainly and will do that. Okay. Let's move on to the, uh, the question of the current state of the green space, um, including Marie's uh, desire to, to share some pictures of how it looks um, now, and I, uh, let's make that our next topic, but also I'd ask if anybody has a, anything else they want to address beyond that, if you would drop it into the chat, just, just to alert us so that as we, you know, as we get closer to uh, 7.30 um, and time starts to get short, we can be sure to, 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 to address that. We'll still, let you, we'll still let you ask the question or make the comment in person, but if you could just put it into the chat for purposes of managing the meeting, that would be appreciated. So Marie, do you wanna, do you wanna kick it off on the, yeah, the I'm going to state try. of the green space. Yes, I'll try to share this. Let's see, share screen. It says you can't share. Oh, there. Okay, there we go. So, this is the current state of the back of that green space. And I know that. Frank is just saying, can, can you hear me? See that? Well, yeah, like, we're not, we're not being able to see, see the video yet. Yeah. We can't yeah. see yeah. your pictures. Hmm. Okay. Share screen again. A share screen start video. There we go. Uh, That's okay. it. So this is the current state. It's only two pictures. I take pictures every week and Frank continues to say that this is being taken care of. And they did take a machete or a chainsaw to it a month ago and, you know, and where we saw pictures before and um, they didn't clean it up. They just cut those brushes, those shrubs, and they left all the dead um, stuff on the, on the shrubs and now they're brown and they're ugly. So I have been writing to Frank since September, 2019. 
and I've been right and and since March 2019, I've been trying to figure out who is supposed to be taking care of this property. So for two years plus, I've been asking DCAM, Frank, Ross, Parish Ross, anybody to please, can you just, you know, take care of this property? And they said, yeah, yeah, we're gonna, we have somebody on it every two weeks, every two days, never happened, it never happened. And it's been looking just like this for two, more than two and a half years. And, and these trees were alive before the state took this property over. All the trees were alive, the shrubs were alive, it was beautifully maintained, and it's not. And that is a problem for me because I just don't believe Frank any more about what you say. You say it's taken care of, I'll take care of it. I write to you, I'll look into it. Nothing happens, you know? And two and a half years, do you feel, I mean, do you understand how, I, I just think that you're a sadist on some level because you just let this keep happening even though you know we are all concerned about this prop, this area, you know? And why is it after this amount of time that this still looks like this? It's a travesty and it's embarrassing to me when I bring a friend over to my house. They have to look at this shit. It's really horrible. Please tell me why this is so. So I, I'm not sure if you want to hear my answer. Um, I've tried to get this on a regular schedule. I've addressed this in the past and I'll do it again now. Um, the state has not had any staff over there until this year. And we tried to get a company in through DCAM to clean up the area. Um, they are responsible for it. And quite frankly, I am not pleased with the picture that you're showing me. I have not looked at that. It's been like this, Frank. Do you, you should come well, by once a I week. Can, you I don't come by once a week, I have to admit. But I do come by fairly uh, and then, and then you your presentation, Rick said it looked good. You said it looked good. This is what it looks like. It does not look good. Thanks, so Maria. Please I, don't tell everybody that no, you're taking care wait, of this wait. property. Can, can I make a suggestion here? Maybe to, uh, to Frank, maybe one of the things we should do is you should come by. We should arrange for you to come by um, at some point in the next couple of weeks at some mutually convenient time and take a look. And all of us can talk through like how we would like it to look very Happy specifically. And I... You know, I, I live on the street, but I feel least strongly because I live at the other end. But Marie, Cinda, everybody else who, who looks directly onto this can describe, you know, how, how, idea, how it really should be looking. And I don't know whether that's to be mulched, whether it's to do the, 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 the trimming of the shrubs in a more, you know, sympathetic fashion or whatnot. But it just, I, I think that coming up with some actual description and you being there would be a way to try to maybe find- And maybe Jessica it. could be there too. Yeah, but is that, is that, can we, can we, do we, we all think that that's something we could, we should do? Well, I, I agree, and I will have a, uh, the appropriate people with me, right. and I'll schedule maybe through you, David, if that would be okay. It just makes it easier because you have everybody's yep. emails and all of that, and uh, Rachel will take that in now, and we'll get that organized for a couple of weeks out. Right. One thing I just, I just did an observation on this, and this is just my opinion, but one of the things we, we, we probably should talk through is like, on the one hand, we want the green to be a barrier, to be a visual barrier and, and whatnot. On the other hand, we don't want it to be such to, to create areas of concealment because that attracts people as we know. Yeah. So that's one of the things maybe we should try to figure out as a group is, you know, what's the balance there that we're trying to strike and how, how do we, how do we have it accomplish the aesthetic purpose that people want without- Juniper trees. <laughs> cre yeah, without, without, create, without creating a, you know, a, a, a area for congregation. But so so we'll so we'll schedule that for the next few weeks. Does that work for people? Obviously, in in in, in you know we'll we'll figure it out collectively what the schedule is. Sure. Okay. Does anybody David, else want to say anything about the the green space? Uh, I wanted to say current iteration. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to ask one question, which I think is very important. We've had no security behind that building and along the side of the 109 lot. 
And I, you know, know that Frank did state that he would be putting in, they would be doing security and cameras once the building is opened. But we need that security now, Frank. And we need those lights now. Is there any way in which you uh, can get the state to, you know, provide this for us? Because there is no security back there. Yeah, and you know, I always try and be transparent. I'm sorry to overuse that word. It's used inappropriately many times and I try not to do that. I've been just trying to own up, you know, to what we do and what we don't have as resources. We have not had external patrol resources involved with the security of the building. It's all been internal. I've stated, I think, believe I've stated that before. Uh, there's just a security desk and there's two or three officers there for the building internally in itself, inside. Um, there have been occasionally, and, and I think one of the butters actually said it to me uh, sometime this week, that they would walk, they'd have to bump into one of the security guards walking the property, and that that security guard said, well, you know, they were swapping out. And so the bottom line is, uh, as I understand it, and we will take all this back, and I promise, um, Gilbane is taking control over the building in a month, less than a month. A um, few days. <laughs> Where are we? <laughs> what day are we? Um, and, um, you know, they'll be taking over the responsibility of security within the building. I'm not sure how that extends outside, but we will bring that up in the design team that you see in the first slide, the second slide of this presentation. Those folks that are on that will discuss that immediately, and I will have a response to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and so, and so Frank, and, and, and so just Frank, I was the person who brought it up. So I just, for the edification of the group. I, I was unaware, but happened to learn a few weeks ago by running into one of the, the uh, members of the private security team that the state has hired, that there is there are people on site there. And I gather from you, Frank, that their primary responsibility is the physical security of the interior of the building. But this man who identified himself as a supervisor was in the, uh, the H lot uh, where <laughs> by, by, by BMC, and he was asking somebody who was about to sit down in the parking lot and you know do some uh, some uh, unacceptable behavior to to move along and so at least he was taking it upon himself to so and he told me they they also they were sort of you know taking it upon themselves to dissuade people from being up in the in the loading dock and that sort of a place so if that private security team and i understand it's changing now that it's going to gilbane but if that is able to continue and they, they uh, take an interest in what goes on outside, that would be a big positive. Um, yeah, and also if they, if, they, if, they, if they create a way for us as neighbors, if we see something like somebody sleeping in the loading dock or that sort of a thing to contact them, that would be a, a big net plus. Thanks, David. But to I, fill I the gap between now and, and when you have your actual, you know, DPH security on site, you know, when you actually have the, have the building several years from now. Thanks, David. I think so, I didn't. So I just like to put that on the table. Yeah, I did. Um, I think when we were chatting about that, um, mentioned that I, you know I was actually very pleased to hear it because I assume that that was because DCAM has been listening, um, and that that security officer, the change of their actually doing some outside patrol is because of that. So I want to thank the folks that were responsible for that. I was not so. I raised it, but I was not responsible for the response of that security team. That was DCAM, so thank you. Um, as I said, we will take this back. We will discuss it with Jim and others from Gilbane and from DCAM, because um, I don't know the scope and I don't want to shoot from the hip here right. uh, incorrectly. So we'll take that one back. Promise we will address it at the next meeting. Okay, yeah, let's yeah, just put that as an agenda item for the next time. Um, David, did you say you wanted to? You said you wanted to talk about the yeah. fire pump location. Yeah, I just, um, I, I wanted to, and this sort of piggybacks on sort of the tail end of the, the green space discussion. Um, you know, this fire pump obviously is a new addition to your presentation this uh, go around. And uh, I totally understand where it, um, the reasoning is from your explanation. There's been changes in code. There's issues about, around um, uh, flood zoning and, and whatnot. Um, but you know, looking at this picture that you just, thank you for putting it back up. What I'm seeing too is sort of, and, uh, um, uh, yeah, right there. Uh, well, what, what I'm right seeing from that there is, is again, um, there was the, the giving of some green space back um, and, and with the removal of several of the parking spaces. And then 
again, removal. So it's almost in my mind, sort of smoke and mirrors of um, we're gonna we're gonna put this this green space over here. Look over here, but don't look over here where we're taking it also away um, and putting this what I know is just an initial rendering and is not the final product, but it looks like a, a shipping container being placed um, in the back of our of our yards um, across from our yards and and so. Uh, I, I wonder uh, again out loud if there are other alternative spaces um, again where we can maintain that green space um, and not chip into that and 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 then um, you know thoughts that come to mind is there's that terrace there if there were trees that were sort of maintained in that green space this fire pump could hopefully be housed up there it'd be above the the, the water zone uh, the flood zone uh, I know from prior years, there was a bicycle um, cage in the front area uh, of, um, of the East Newton Pavilion, uh, further in the front of that terrace that's not pictured in this image that um, is closer probably to the dental school interface with the building, um, which to me in my mind seems like a very reasonable spot. I don't know enough obviously about the, the requirements by, by the, um, the fire, fire um, people, the, the firemen. Uh, uh, and so, but um, uh, again, this is, this in my mind viewing this today sort of seemed like you were meeting some of our requests, but then also sliding something in on the back end and hoping that no one says anything. Um, and it just, it just, in my mind, just seems like sort of moving, moving pieces, uh, you know, moving chairs on the, on the deck of the Titanic. And it's not, you know, the ship is still not floating the way I want, would hope it would float. So uh, I, I wonder if there's also opportunities um, in some of the spots that we, that we deemed um, as uh, unusable um, uh, for parking, uh, that this could be loaded in either in the equipment yard or um, sort of like I was saying in that, that other space uh, where, the, where the bike area would be. So uh, that's the other thing I was hoping to raise here tonight. Thanks, David, for your thoughtful suggestions. I want to assure you, and, and we need to build your trust um, of us more. And it's evident in what has been said by a number of people tonight. And that's the hope that this regular meeting will be, um, is a trust building exercise in addition to all that it is now. But I assure you that this fire pump was not, we didn't try and tuck it in while we give a little green space and we thought some you know, nefariously uh, how we could tuck it into this diagram now and give you green space and hide it. No, that was not any part of any discussion anybody on this call has had. It <clears throat> has arisen of late over the past two weeks. We put it in there to be as transparent as possible in the current design state it's in, which is very preliminary, as Rick said. There were folks that said, well, why don't we hold it till we have a little bit better uh, design of it so we can show it in a more complete phase. And we decided, no, let's be transparent right off the bat. This is our next meeting. We know we're going to have to put it in there now and why. We have to show it so that the neighbors can see, number one, that we're being transparent, and number two, what impact it might have. But it's not the final impact because the final design isn't done. Again, we're in the planning phase. This is not, this is all settled and you guys have to accept it. We're never saying that. Um, so this was not a trade-off or a, a, some kind of shenanigans about present a little more green space and hope you don't know this is the fire pump. This was a very um, straightforward decision to do it this way so that we could be transparent in the current state of design, which we will do in every meeting. Um, so I hope we can gain your trust not to think that we are uh, playing that those kind of games. We don't do that. Just Frank, uh, I, I appreciate you saying that. Um, then my sort of follow-up would be if there is a way that we could work with you and Rick and um, and the rest of the design team um, to try and find, uh, you know, and Jessica as well, to try and find an alternative uh, place where um, what looks to be, a, again, a very industrial uh, addition to the building um, is placed in a more industrial portion of the property away from that, that green space. And uh, I appreciate all of your efforts to try and examine that over the next few weeks before we meet again. We will certainly do that promise, David. And I know I can see Rick writing the whole time we were talking. So I know he's right. taking his notes as well. And so is Jessica. 
And we can any... talk about that if you want to join us on the walkthrough in the next week or so when we go out there. We can talk a little bit about that too. I can grab a copy of the plan with uh, from Rick and carry it with me. We can talk a little mm -hmm. bit about it and you know see what there is to talk about. See what alternatives might exist or not exist, and what we might be able to do to mitigate the impact of that visually. Could I just ask one other quick question? Where are the exhaust fans located on the roof of that building? You've since it's, since it's displayed. Where, where where are they positioned on that building? Uh, the two that I highlighted are about right here. Okay, thank you. Yep, good. And just to be again, just to you know, make sure we're not seeming to be not transparent. There are other exhaust fans that have been up there forever. Yeah. Um, these are the two exhaust pans for the enhanced capabilities for exhaust when it is, as Rick said, a very special situation where you have to evacuate more air than those other fans on the roof can accommodate. Okay. So just to be clear. Okay. So we're at 734. Um, so my suggestion is that unless anyone has any really pressing other concern or comment that we adjourn, but before we do, Frank, um, does it make sense to try to reconvene from your standpoint in a, about another month, setting aside the, the, the walkthrough, but just, just for one of these meetings? It's it sort of a monthish. Yeah, the design team, design team actually suggested that we set a schedule for August. And I said, well, let's get the abutters availability and make sure that's what works for them. So um, we can shoot your times in August. When I okay, well, so let's maybe August. think, or I mean, it's the end of June now. So let's think maybe early August. And then two other things I just wanted to mention. One is that you and I and, and this group also had talked about the notion of having a wider community meeting, which would be sort of cast more around some of the big picture issues yeah. that may come up as the, uh, as the facility opens, sort of the patient base, et cetera, et cetera. And that we will aim to do uh, in the coming month. Is that still, is that still a possibility for you? Um. So on the wider community, I and mean, forgive me if I'm misrepresenting anything, David, for the wider community, I have in my head that we'll do it in September. And the reason why is because, you know, this is a number one, as you can tell from what's advanced even over the last few weeks, this is a, um, you know, an evolving right. um, process. It'll give the time if we wait till September for Gilbane to take control of the building to have all of the schedule worked out as to when, what work is going to be done. Because as uh, Jim referred to earlier, we've already moved the schedule out. So the immediate impact I was worried about getting before the community before it happened, I thought was then gonna be July 1, and it is not now. It's moved off till April of next year. So with that added time, I thought we could advance the design more and then give a better community-wide presentation than we could right now. But okay. if you want us to do something different, yeah, I'm, I'm not. I, I don't personally have a, a problem with that. But let's just let's just keep that. Let's just maybe pick that conversation up on exactly when that timing should be. I mean, it, it's it mostly what would, would, as I would envision it, probably most of what people would be asking about would be things that wouldn't be happening until 2024 anyway, because they would relate to the hospital actually being open as opposed to the planning stuff that we're talking about now. Um, but anyway, so just 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 to put a pin on that, and then and then finally, so what I'll do in terms of scheduling the walkthrough. Tentatively, we'll th think about it as happening in the next two weeks. Um, I will email everybody on the same contact list that I used uh, to notice people for this meeting. Um, and people can sort of compare notes on, on, on what's best for them. And then we'll mesh that with your schedule and we'll go from there. That'd be great. Rachel Hunt has been so helpful in this to match up okay. schedules and make them work. And she'll be doing that as well with you, David, if that's okay. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you, Frank, and everybody uh, from the team uh, on your side. And thank you to all the neighbors uh, for joining. And uh, we'll see some of you in a week or two. And otherwise, we'll reconvene sometime in kind of early August tentatively. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much. Bye, guys. Thanks, everyone.